Have you ever found yourself pushed into something, just swept along with the tide because you didn't have time to plan? Does it seem reasonable that within your settings, your characters may experience the same issues? Let's talk about timing. Welcome to the Worldcraft Club podcast, a show for writers looking to create rich, immersive worlds for their audience to get lost in time and time again. My name is James, your host today, and I'm joined once again by Andrew Zimba, author of In Times of War, A Tale of our Dalincor. We'd actually spoken with him a little while back in the audio podcast, episode 55, Creating Captivating Settings. So go ahead and check that out if you want to hear a little bit more about his book he's writing. But today, we've got the plausibility of time. Andy, do you want to kick us off here? What 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 caused you to pursue this idea? It was from your blog, right? Yeah, James. Uh, thanks for having me on. Good to be good to be back. And uh, of course, always love chatting world building. So it's awesome what you're doing with Worldcraft Club. So the plausibility of time. This is this is kind of a combination of my own journey as a writer, studying film, studying TV, being a game master, and I think one of those aspects of world building is how is time being used? Do you have time to plan mm -hmm. or just enough time to react? And if you have time to yeah. plan, what are those other things? It could still be this dramatic moment, but what are those other preparatory things? If you think about it as a world and what would the characters do? I think mm -hmm. that's an interesting distinction versus I've got time, some time to plan versus I'm reacting. I think though the first rule of world building, at least for me is, build the world you want and tell the story you want. So yeah. everything else is just helpful tips and tricks. So hopefully this is helpful to everybody, but if any questions, see rule one. That's also <laughs> what, 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 you, what, what you all say is, what are you trying to do? Yeah, right? yeah. What's your goal? And then here's a community which can help you with, here's some ways to navigate it. Because there's, there's oftentimes many ways to approach something and, and many ways to get to the same the same result. And I think the aspect of time is a particularly interesting one. Also with just as a few little other preambles around world building. Yeah, yeah. It's so expansive. It can include so many elements. But I look at it as in terms of plausibility of things, it's what items do you want to include? Mm. If you want to bake a loaf of bread, you can bake a very elegant and tasty loaf of bread with just a few ingredients. Yeah. You can also do a five course meal, which maybe has a hundred ingredients in it. And which one you choose is your choice. But if you're baking bread, if you take the proportions of these ingredients and don't follow the recipe and do things dramatically different or the preparation process, you're gonna end up with something different than bread. Yeah. So I look at it as more as in, in building a world, do I have to include everything and in all, you know, you see like lists upon lists of here's things you could include. Yeah. I look at it more as whatever you've chosen, how does it all come together? And that, that's the way I approach, I approach this. Um, sometimes it can also be like, it's all we can do is figure out the characters, figure out the setting. What's the A plot, the B plot. Yeah. And thinking about things in other dimensions or looking at the Rubik's cube, we may have one side lined up, but then we start to, shift the cube and like, well, this side isn't lined up and this side isn't lined up. I think that's the other piece of creating an immersive world is taking a step back. Sometimes it's stream of consciousness and I have to write this down or I'm going to forget it. I totally get that. But once you have that foundation, look at it from a different point of view. Yeah. And the, the Star Trek uh, chain of command, Star Trek Next Generation chain of command episode or episodes it's it's two it's two it's a two part series it's yeah, to be yeah. continued and then there's so two hours so I might go back and forth with episodes or parts so so bear with yeah. me but we're same. talking about talking about the same thing but I think before we get into that because that's that's a familiar topic mm. let's just take a very basic example yeah and with world building I think this is the best way to talk some kind of like pithy pithy boil down but then what does that actually mean let's use some examples to illustrate the point. Yeah. And if we were going to write a story about unlikely heroes. Yeah. And we said, okay, here's our premise. There's bank robbers. They have robbed such and such bank. They've cleared out all the deposit boxes. They've taken the cash and they've taken everybody there hostage. Yeah. 
they have a direct line to the mayor. Mm. They call the mayor. They say, here's the situation. Here's what we're going to do if you don't provide these other things they're demanding. Then the, the mayor calls in, his, calls in the aide and says to the aide, please go down to the nearby mall, which is near the bank, find five random people, maybe the first five people that you meet yeah, and have them resolve this hostage situation. Yeah. That sounds very bizarre, especially if it's an analog to our present day. Yeah. They're like, let's not right. call the SWAT team. Let's not call like, you know, a- any sort of specialized negotiator. Let's just find five people at the local bar, local mall. I'm just bringing them in. But yeah. that sounds really familiar as well. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, honestly? Yeah. Where they well, just bring every it? D&D game. <laughs> like the tavern, yeah. right? Like, yeah, no, that's that's that's, 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 that's really funny. Yeah. It's I, yeah, no, that that's 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 wild. And that happens uh you know, it, it's it's kind of we try to bend that plausibility a lot in 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 the stuff we write, right? Like and you know, try to try to kind of put the unlikely hero in place, which is exactly what happens in the chain of command episode in some ways. Like it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre choice, but you you raise it. Yeah, sorry, sorry go, go ahead. Oh, well, I was gonna say it might, it might actually behoove us to just sort of give a brief synopsis of what happens in that episode to kind of give people a sense of like why it's so pertinent here, because it's generally regarded, I believe, as one of the best episodes of the next generation to ever have like been released. But it's also <laughs> it's got some it's got some very Star Trek problems, right? <laughs> yes, we, we should we should we should talk about the episode, but you raise a really interesting point as well about about D and D and the plausibility. Yeah, and I guess the different focus as well. Where D and D, it's about delighting your players, right? Yeah, just yeah, yeah Oftentimes, yeah. just relaxing, having fun, the spotlight on the players, uh, versus maybe writing a story where there's there's more interest in. Um, kind of the overall comprehensive world and how do all of these elements fit together. But you raise a great point of where is everybody else? While this bank robbery was unanticipated, mm. there ha- if it's an analog to our world, banks exist. There's been robberies before. Yeah, there's yeah. a protocol and response that should be that should play out as well. So with uh, with Star Trek Chain of Command, the next generation, this takes place in uh, season number six. This is December of 1992. Oh man. Yeah. So we're, we're going back in time, but in some ways, years. It's, <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Sure. As, as a time of recording. Yeah. But at the same, interesting though, interestingly, it's also in a sense, the first deep space nine episode. Yeah. Yeah. Because deep space nine starts January of 93. Yeah. And chain of command, like you said, is very acclaimed as an episode, there's so many interesting elements, but the biggest world building element is we need something dramatic to launch our new show. Yeah. And it's, and, it, it so ahead. they were introducing essentially races in Star Trek that had not been explored as much. And they were introducing a lot of conflicts that were brewing that deep space nine was based around. Right. So they had, they had a lot of lifting to do in this one episode in a lot of ways. Did, did Cardassians? I'm not sure if they were referenced before. I, I think that, I think they recall. likely I think they likely were, but probably not at depth. Like I've got to admit, I don't yeah. recall. But like because yeah. DS9 is like so focused on the Cardassians that as as a race, as in, it, it, yeah. it's functionally like there's there's more depth they've got to clear with them. I expect, you know. Yeah, you're certainly right that they go back and revisit it with within these two hours. Yeah, the the tone and the approach to it is very gritty, very raw, and mm. which is different. Elite. It's different for Star yeah. Trek, right? Like Star Trek is usually quite optimistic and very technologically forward and and forward thinking. Yeah, but this one darker darker tone. Yeah, and, and establishing the, the the like you said the conflict, reestablishing the. Cardassians, uh, you you get a look into kind of what's been going on with these border disputes, the the political wranglings, mm-hmm. but also what's the dramatic moment to launch Deep Space Nine? It's Picard yeah. getting captured and tortured, and 
when Deep Space Nine starts and they're talking about how the Cardassians are our adversaries, who's most likely to watch the show? It's people who watched Next Generation and say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Those are the bad guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they and look what they the did guard. to the hero. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So they, they, they I, had to put Picard in a situation where the Cardassians could catch him. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and I think part of this is I'm a fan of Star Trek. I wouldn't have spent oh, yeah. this much time yeah, yeah. thinking about this episode. But I think there's this other piece where we can enjoy a show, but then also look at it from a craft perspective. A hundred percent. Yeah. What makes scenes amazing scenes and which maybe where there's some other options about how it could have, how it could have played out. So that is a lead into time to plan versus time to react. Yeah. This, the start of the episode is Admiral Nechev showing up and saying, Picard, you're relieved of command. So you're this, going on this top secret mission. And, yeah, and the, the Admiral turns up in person, right? Like, Yes. That's and they, they do have long distance communication <laughs> that they can use in Star Trek, right? Like it's not like he had to fly there to be like, "Hey, what's up? This is this is what's happening." Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's there's four elements that that fit into this is one, why Picard? Yeah. Two, how much intelligence and preparation do they provide to him? Yeah. There's the transportation issue, yeah, and then and then how many people accompany him? Just to kind of boil down each each of these pieces, yeah. Um, maybe we'll we'll come back to why Picard. Maybe we'll come back to that one, yeah. yeah. But the first one, there, there's a line of dialogue in the episode that he's be he's begun his training process with Doctor Crusher and with Worf, and he says to the, the replacement uh, captain, Captain Jellicoe, who's taken over, hmm. he says, I'm operating off of intelligence that's two years old. It would be nice if we had more recent intelligence. Yeah. And I think the point also here is there is a sense of competence that comes through in the show with the Enterprise is the best of the best. Yeah. And... Starfleet is a highly professional, highly competent organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Admiral could have said, here is the latest intelligence, mm. or we're going to help you with this. We're going, this is an incredibly difficult, incredibly risky mission. Yeah. Now we have time to plan. How are we helping? And it's also a Federation and Starfleet uh, value of you, you protect your crew. You do what you can to safeguard life. So we're going to send you on this risky mission, but we're not going to give you any intelligence. He actually, Picard mentions it's kind of offhand to the other captain and says, you know, we could do this to help you. And he's like, that would be really great. Yeah. So why wasn't that piece done, yeah. done up front? Well, I, and and this is the thing is that uh, so so the context of the mission that they're sending him on as well is that it is functionally a special forces raid on yes. a suspected Cardassian bioweapons facility. And like Picard is the captain of what what amounts to a science vessel, right? Like because the, the, the Enterprise is not a ship of, of war. It's an exploration ship. It's like well armed, but it is primarily for exploring. And, um, or at least that's how Picard introduces himself here. We're explorers. And, um, it's just so weird to take the captain of somebody who, something, who, what that amounts to a survey ship and to say, look, you're a really good leader. You should lead a special forces team. And even Picard's like immense skill set still places him so strangely for this. And I know we're, we're going to talk about this a bit more, but I think the context is kind of interesting there that it's like, again, special forces raid, let's send the bridge crew, like... A, a friend of mine um, on on the server, Dave, he had said, like, the best Star Trek movie is Galaxy Quest. And, like, I think he's hmm. I think he's 100% right. Like, it's like, anytime they have to do something dangerous, it's like, quick, assemble the bridge crew. Like, we need all our senior officers on this planet yeah. when it's blowing up. Like, it just never makes sense. It's like, never send down the red shirts to go investigate. No, let's send the bridge yeah. crew. So it's it's very Star Trek. No, like it's it's in keeping with, with the vibe of the show in some ways. Let's send let's send Picard, special forces mission. You know, we'll send a balding Shakespearean actor. <laughs> well, 
Well, he he is he is fifty at the time yeah. as well, and yeah. it also just speaks to uh, why not send people half his age, yeah, to go to go do something like this as well. I think there's this other piece of it's a TV show, and there's seven or eight main characters, and they need to be involved in the scene. So even even within that, to practicalities, some, yeah, yeah, even within just those limitations, um, there's other nuances you could change. Yeah. Right, that yeah, yeah. make it more, this is dangerous, but we are trying to make it as successful as possible yeah. for you at the same time. So kind of plausibility, but also within these parameters that that they've established as well. Hmm. The let's I guess let's talk about Picard. They do say a few times that he's the one who understands the, and thank you for mentioning the what what the, the bioweapon facility, I, I yeah, guess I didn't yeah. mention that. So thank you for that. Like the reason for this mission, the importance of the mission. And there's these carrier waves that they're saying they could launch an attack on us through this very uh, maybe subtle way or very sophisticated way. Yeah. And Picard is the only one, uh, presumably in all of Starfleet, presumably in all of the Federation, <laughs> the United Federation of Planets, that has knowledge about this based on his time from being on the Stargazer, yeah. Which I think stretches stretches things a little bit. But if you said he's the most competent, okay, well we can maybe take that at face value that he knows the best, he knows the most about it out of anybody. Yeah, yeah. I think for an administrative captain, it's probably a stretch, but still <laughs> we can we, we can okay we'll we'll kind of let that one let that one go yeah but we, we need to come back to what's the risk of sending him none nonetheless yeah on transportation picard actually has to go arrange transport to this other planet oh they find like some smuggler or trader uh, a ferengi captain who takes them yeah to this planet and again the admiral could have said again within kind of the the mold of star trek uh we've arranged transport we figured it's this with, out yeah. yeah it's with the third party so there's plausible deniability this is a clandestine mission yeah and he Picard could say well how can i trust this person well we caught a few of his relatives engaged in illegal activities and yeah. we've agreed to release them if he brings you there and brings you back safely. Like, so there's some plausibility to this. They've, again, they're, they're helping him. This isn't, yeah. I want to get Picard killed or captured. It was only because despite our best efforts, yeah. this happened. Yeah. So I, I think that's an interesting piece to look at. And then how many people go with Yeah. as, as well. And, and it just being a uh, Picard, uh, Worf and Crusher and, you know the admiral doesn't bring individuals who's already trained uh, for this particular uh, for this mission, or yeah. just saying we can bring members of the Enterprise security crew, bring uh, just to keep the number of extras in the showdown. Bring bring four or five. Yeah, you know, I, I, something it, like that. It, it's like the same problem they had with Armageddon. If you ever saw that movie, it's where they 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 uh you know there's a, there's an asteroid headed toward Earth. And uh, that the premise of the movie is that they, instead of training astronauts to drill, they train drillers to become astronauts. Because yeah. the, the, the logic they have is like the astronauts, they don't understand the drill. You know, there's like the things you need to understand about drilling that you just couldn't understand. And so like you need somebody with the knack. So they take, you know, it's the whole like kind of. You know, take a bunch of blue collar guys, you know, who are used to like very physical labor and just like putting them in these like, you know, like in this very like military rigorous environment with very like yeah. highbrow two dollar words thrown around everywhere and just sort of enjoy, you know, but it's uh, it's again, it's setting up that premise. It's like the Armageddon principle of just like, let's just put some fish out of water in here and have well, Worf is very much a fish in water in special forces training, but like yeah. everybody else, yeah. it's just kind of weird to dump them in there. But let's see. How. It's also Another practical thing is like, uh, like actors have agents, and those agents want those actors to be able to demonstrate range, and so there will be times like I've seen this before in TV shows where they have an episode that focuses on one character doing something that yeah. they don't usually do, and I think yeah. some of it is that their agent was like, "Look, this guy always plays the butt of every joke, but he's got some serious game on the dramatic side. We need to give him a chance, you know? And yeah. so they'll like squeeze in an episode that gives them a chance to sort of experiment with more dramatic roles, you know? 
Yeah. So it's like, I don't know, so some of that features in as well. I'm pretty sure contract obligations and like agents and things like that. So you've got, you know, I, I can't remember who it was who played Crusher, but kind of going like, hey, we want we want her to be in this position to play this more sort of intense, sort of dramatic scene and do more gritty stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, which is, I don't know, that's just, <laughs> just another interesting practicality. It's got to like chuck in there. But yeah, so it's... I, it's 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 interesting. So where does where does where does your sense of of time fit into this though? Because I'm seeing some like plausibility issues here. We've got like the Federation who are kind of seeming a little on the incompetent side here, where they're taking yeah. sort of a, a sci of what what amounts to the the commander of a science ship, who by all means is just a very experienced, well respected captain. There's 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 you know there's 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 some plausibility in there, but they kind of seem to be flubbing it a little bit and sort of letting him just like manage the whole situation when you know. You can be competent in one field and not competent in another, and it's like it's weird to try to sort of dump somebody yeah. in there. So yeah, like how does how does time fit into this? I, I think it has to do with with the premise of yeah the admiral, like you said, showing up and obviously having this mission in mind, and then it's what can we do to make this as successful as possible? We have yeah. time to plan. Yeah, and if we think about this, is we can essentially pull resources from the entire federation or from starfleet yeah and this is this is a this this facility is a threat or potential threat hmm. to the federation how do we make this the most successful it looks a little bit like kind of a, a incompetent kind of haphazard planning along with it and i think to keep the star trek flow like, hey, it's going to be the bridge crew is going to do be in most of the action. Mm -hmm. But we could do these other things to make it seem like, yes, we're concerned about the safety of these individuals to send them to another planet, to send them to an underground bunker, to send them to a place where we don't know how many adversaries are there. You start to add all these things up. And it's like the, the idea of the dramatic idea to eventually use this as a, a catalyst for Deep Space Nine, we can still preserve we can still preserve that original idea, but yeah. how we frame it, and there is time to plan in terms of how it's set up. I can give you an alternate version with more from the re pure reaction standpoint and how they figured out just to look at, it's one thing to say, hey, they could have done this differently, but what are some ways they could? And we've talked about that within the original parameters yeah. of, of the episode. Yeah, like there, there are ways to fix some of these, like th some of these things that you sort of look at from your chair and you're like, huh, like why, why did it have to be like, and, and again, like we've got to stress this episode is one of the best regarded episodes in next generation history and is even cited by some as like a, a, a necessary viewing as a precursor to like later series is like Picard and stuff. But it's, it's kind of, it's interesting in the context, we still have a good episode but there are some ways that we can look at it, like you say, from a craft perspective, out of love, and kind of go, hey, you know, well, it would have made sense if the Federation could have wangled this, or if they could have, like, reasoned this way. And I, I think what you're kind of, like, circling toward is, is, is this idea of, like, if you have enough time to do something, you as a writer, if you allow that time within your setting, you're sort of accountable to explain, like, how it was used <laughs> in the, in the, in the, yeah. in, in a plausible way. Right. Yeah, e exactly. Or to explain a why, why some of these things aren't, aren't options, but you yeah. may, you make an excellent point about the range of Patrick Stewart <laughs> and, and the acting yeah. that's done. I mean, it is, uh, he has, he has range. He's like you phenomenal. Said, and he, yeah. he does a great job in the episode. So that is kind of the, the seminal piece that carries the episode. And maybe you, then you forget about, these other elements, just given the the raw emotion that takes place in that, but I think it's as we're looking at overall craft. Yeah, there's other things that could have even still led to that. Like mm. even despite our best efforts, he's still captured. Yeah, and we still have that same moment. We're not we're not touching with those very dramatic moments. Not nothing that we've talked about tampers with that in any way. It's more mm. more the lead up to it, and we can still have that dramatic moment. I think if we were to look at this as an alternate option and how it's just pure reaction is you still have the border dispute. You still have the Cardassians featured. You have the Enterprise show up early and Picard does like a captain's log and says, 
we're here as part of this border dispute. There's this task force that's arriving. Uh, Captain Jellicoe will be coming because of his prior experience, but they're not here yet. Yeah. So we're, we're here first. They're doing their typical scanning and data reports back. There's this little anomaly that then ties into this carrier wave that, that Picard is familiar with from the Stargazer. He says, launch a probe. Let's figure out more what's going on with this. Yeah. Then they uncover there might be a facility here. And this could be tremendous. One, they could use this at any time. Two, this is a tremendous leverage that they could use against us in this border dispute. Mm. And maybe based on our current treaties or agreements, this is in, uh, in violation of what we've already agreed to. Yeah. So he kind of, he says, this could be used against the Federation. I'm going to act now. Yeah. And we are actually going to intervene Yeah. with this. But he says, I have the knowledge. I have to go. The, the crew says, are you crazy? He says, yeah. no, we have to take this, this bargaining chip off the table for them. Yeah. And we're going to do this. This is too big of a threat. We're going to go in and I'm going to lead this. Yeah. And launch additional probes. Uh, how we arrange transport becomes an issue. But let's say Jordy can say, we've actually been working on configuring the electronic signature of our shuttlecraft <laughs> and we can make them appear like other ships. Now, if you that. see them, vi if you see them visually, you're going to know it's a Federation shuttlecraft, but if they're just using long range scanners, we might be able to fool them. And we've been tinkering with this and we were looking for an opportunity oh, that's, to that's try That's very it. Star Trek. That's very Star Trek. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, why don't we try shit. it now? Yeah. You know, they yeah, land yeah. on the planet. I would think if you're planning a special forces mission into this place, I would I would say, and you still want to keep it small. I think you're probably talking more like 30 people, yeah, with backup backup shuttle craft, uh, people to watch the ships. Enough, yeah. more than three people to go in and go do this. Yeah, you could have you could. So we're serious about this. This is important. Still have the same thing play out with maybe some people don't make it. Maybe some do. They get back. The other main characters get back. Uh, but Picard is nonetheless captured. And maybe there's this much more of this desperate fight to well, preserve yeah. the captain. And it's, it, it's interesting because like there's it, essentially what you're kind of going through here is like, a, is um, you know, watch Andrew Zimba fix this episode. Right. Like, and I, I know we're kind of, we're not saying like, you know, you're, you're fixing it. It's regarded as one of the best episodes. And like, I, I, you know, a lot of love for Star Trek and this particular episode in mind, but you're kind of like looking at it and going, there are some implausible, implausible problems here. And it seems to me like when you're trying to fix those problems, you kind of go, well, you know, if you take the episode and keep the timeline and you kind of go, well, the Federation could have done this and this could have happened. And you have all of these tweaks but if you truncate the time and you just re remove a lot of that and suddenly decisions are made in a much more urgent and hurried manner, suddenly yes. you just have to explain far, far less. Like it is, yes. it is extremely efficient just to say there's no time, <laughs> like you know, and just like, yeah. it's like we could either do all of these tweaks or just there's no time, <laughs> like, and then and then you've solved the problem much more elegantly than if you go through and try to retain the original like lengthy timeline where the Federation has been preparing but apparently done nothing, and then sort of like send an admiral like in person to Picard to say yeah. you have to run a special forces squad. You know, it's like it's yeah. you, you get rid of all of that mess by just making the timeline really small. Yeah, that's yeah, and it's really efficient, and it's Picard. <laughs> And it's Picard saying, and for these reasons, I'm making this snap, reckless, whatever you want to call it, decision. Yeah. But he still he still explains it to the crew and says, for these reasons, we're doing this. Yeah. And then we're not we're not touching anything from the time he's captured. All yeah. that stays. It's just the lead in. And then in this alternative timeline, then Captain Jellico shows up and he hails the Enterprise and said, I'd like to come aboard. I'd like to speak with Picard. And Riker says Picard is in here. He's captured. You still have that adversary. Where yeah, that's the B, the B plot, abrasive. right? Is is Riker yeah. learning to sort of submit and be a bit of a team player with somebody who who's not used to his style, right? Yeah. And you also have this very abrasive captain, which is a nice contrast in the sense of our beloved captain has been replaced. 
Yeah. Well, if this was a charming and uh, ingratiating new captain, well, then you kind of you don't miss perhaps as much yeah. the old captain. You don't miss Picard. Like, well, this guy's not so bad, but you you draw that contrast, which is nice. I think that's done in many different ways, and that, I think that is done well within the episode. But then you have Jellico basically lose it and say, "Are you kidding me? That this happened? You've created this." much worse situation well it it becomes it because part of the issue as well was that they like so in the episode it was that they 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 kind of didn't want to acknowledge that picard had been captured because that puts egg on their face diplomatically as well um but it also meant that the cardassians didn't have to treat him as a prisoner of war (laughs) so they just said he was a terrorist and so they could do whatever they wanted to him and it was and that's like part partly it was it was the federation's sort of incompetence in 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 the show that sort of put picard in that position whereas in this one it's picard's own reckless actions that put him there which is like yeah an interesting difference and it makes sense picard actually is um a bit more of a cowboy than he gets credit for um even compared with like kirk you know it's people think of kirk as just you know punching people and like sh- yeah. and, and and macking on alien girls uh, but like picard was actually like quite a bit more gung-ho than like he gets credit for you know like he generally yeah. did kind of jump in with both feet and make pretty reckless decisions i think he spent most of his time in the academy like drinking and smoking or something like he was like there, there were like there's yeah. stuff in there whereas Kirk couldn't even fail one test and he got kicked out of the academy for cheating because he couldn't, you know, he couldn't he couldn't stand failing one test. You know, it's kind of yeah. it's funny. Kirk was more of a nerd than Picard, but you wouldn't have thought it. And and like you said the Federation is the aggressor nonetheless. True. I mean, yeah. They're they're basically positioning this potential facility right along the border, but they're still on their side of the border. Yeah. So this yeah. is a bit of this brinksmanship. So the Federation is the one who's the aggressor here as well. Mm. Um, but you could still let the whole, you could have Jellico basically yelling at everybody. You have just made this infinitely worse. So much more complicated. Yeah. For us. But it still plays out where they, they kind of mine this nebula. They detect the other ship and they're basically able to bargain to get, to get Picard back. Now Picard loses but he be the mission is a is a is a failure he loses in that sense yeah but he wins by enduring and surviving and coming back and they didn't break me they almost broke him yeah but but they didn't so he's he's a stronger character coming back but um it's it's quite a thing to say i'm going to send my main character to another planet to go underground into this fortified location to to yeah. get to this point that's that's a big stretch that's kind of th- throwing the ball downfield and let's see if we can run underneath it while it's being thrown to, <laughs> to catch up to it um and i think that's also like just with our own writing again yeah. it's highly acclaimed there's amazing acting they they make it work within that yeah yeah but i think it's also as we're building um our own stories there's also a level of uh restraint Mm. Or what are other options? Or could Picard just tell Data everything he knows about these waves? Yeah, yeah. And just and just send Data. Because yeah. the other side is when they interrogate Picard. Again, this is broader world building as well. And thinking about it, they just keep asking him basically, "What's your defense plans for this particular planet or this particular system?" Yeah. And he and he probably honestly says, "I don't know. I'm not, I'm not involved in that. I'm." the captain of this vessel. They haven't told me the broader picture yet. Yeah. But you could also ask him, well, what are the weaknesses of the enterprise? Yeah. How many warships is the Federation building? What are all these other things that he would know about? And now let's go even more far afield because I just love talking about world building. Here's yeah. this other piece that may not come into this episode, but just as you think about this world you're building, is there's probably Cardassian spies in the Federation territory. Yeah. Well, you could ask Picard a bunch of questions that you think you already know the answer to from your own spy network. Yeah. And then then line up the answers that Picard gives. Do they match what, you know, spy A said? Yeah, they yeah. match pretty closely. Okay, this is a reliable source. Yeah. How about what about spy B? It doesn't actually line up. Is this yeah. spy not that good? Maybe they're yeah. a double agent. 
Maybe there's now this takes it into much farther afield things. But if we just look at here's Cardassian intelligence has captured this person who has the keys to the Federation in a sense, in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. And the Federation has deemed it necessary to risk this person versus sending data versus just let's bombard, let's just unilaterally just bombard the sneak attack and bombard yeah, yeah, yeah. this planet. Just- yeah. <laughs> um, all these things. But again, you then miss the dramatic moment of Picard being in this situation. So there's different ways to to take it. And I think depending on whatever avenue you approach it, what are the things you can do to bolster the story, however you choose to tell it? That would be kind of the the summation of of, of my view of this episode, which is brilliantly done in so many ways. Mm. And then there's also these other pieces too that it's like that could be fixed by just changing a few lines of dialogue along the way as well. Yeah. No, I think that's a that's that's a really really solid summation of of your position on this. I think that's really useful. Essentially, it it kind of sounds like it's one of the things that Seth and I often discuss is like every system that you create, you have to curate, and um. Yeah. It's kind of like having that awareness that like if you create a political system, you have to maintain it. You know, if you create mm-hmm. a magic system, you have to retain it, maintain it. And so like it's kind of systems maintenance is 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 first about keeping it simple, right? Like about like re- reducing yeah. the number of things like is this right. something you want to focus on? And it sounds a, a little bit like one way of avoiding talking about some of the stuff that you may not wish to dive necessarily wholesale into is to truncate your time. So yeah. like if you have a short amount of time on something and you don't want to explain the politics, just explain there's a really precarious situation here. It's about to explode. You need to move means you have to do so much less explaining about Cardassian political maneuvering and like border brinksmanship and like all this kind of stuff. You know, you can, you can sort of read between the lines on a lot of those by just moving things quickly. I think this is vital. I I know that, you know, with with the podcast we're we're talking more to writers as a general rule, but for DMS, I think this is critical. Um, Your dungeon masters or your, or your game masters where a lot of times, like I feel like I walk, Watch folks doing their world building and they tie themselves in knots trying to explain this and that and the reasoning behind it but um it's one of these things uh how to be a great gm says this all the time just throw a banana in there basically just like just get the get stuff moving you know what i mean like don't don't yeah. try to like go into a lengthy explanation and exposition and try to get everything laid out and have everybody understand the intricacies of it but just throw a banana in there and trust your audience to read between the lines. <laughs> it's kind of like a lot of the mentality yeah. of it. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's really good. I appreciate that. I appreciate the, I appreciate the context on that and the explanation going into like that, that episode's a really good one to do because it is such a good episode, but there are uh, neat ways that you could preserve everything that made that episode good without yeah. like sort of these unnecessary complications that were kind of, added into it because it's just yeah yeah you you didn't need to kind of like with a shorter time frame and like the sort of suddenness of them sort of happening upon the weapons facility instead of an admiral turning up and explaining it and like the federation apparently has made no preparations for this at all but hey picard you know you're the captain of this random well not random but like a you know an important science spaceship let's send you down there because you know about the bioweapons and so it's like it is it's like you could avoid straining all that plausibility by not adding a bunch of needless systems in, keeping it simple, writing what you want to write about, yeah. and keeping your time frame short and urgent enough that the actions that you needed to take for, for the sort of story in order to please Patrick Stewart's yeah. agent, in order to keep right. the show moving, in order to explosively introduce DS9, in order to expand upon the deviousness of the Cardassians, you don't yeah. need all this extra stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that a good way of like summing it up yeah, or did, it, ab- did I botch it? Absolutely. Perfect. No, absolutely. Either if you're going to plan, what are those supporting elements that should come into play or Picard reacting in the moment? I did it to save the Federation. 
Yeah. I took this as a credible threat. Yeah. I'm one of the few people who knows what this is capable of. Yeah. And I and couldn't I made allow the it to exist. And I made the choice and I did it to save the Federation. And I sacrificed myself to do that. Well, that's pretty powerful. And then the other Perfect. piece of, like you said, with D&D is just even, let's just say a game, right? Yeah. Instead of trying to figure out how humans and dragons have coexisted for centuries, you know, you could just say it starts with 10 Ten forms are seen flying over these mount this mountain range. Yeah, it's ten dragons. Where did they come from? We don't know. We've heard stories about them. That's we just have fragments of these stories from far flung, tra far flung travels that people have been on. Yeah, right. But what's their origin? In these dragons. We don't know. But they're here, and we yeah. have to react. And you take all of that world building, you know, like you said, just kind of straining that. How does this all fit? They just showed up. We don't know. Right. And, yeah. and that's it. And yeah. but everything flows from that and it makes sense. That's cool. All right. So I think those are really like the key takeaways that we can have here. The things that you can use immediately in any of these given in any of these given situations to kind of just help speed things along. Creating urgency reduces complexity. Moving things quickly at times can help kind of throw you a bit of a life preserver when you'd otherwise be stuck curating a lot of systems that you don't necessarily want to maintain. If you want to write a story about the dragons, by all means, like, write the story about the dragons. But if the dragons are part and parcel of the story, a, a world-building element that you don't necessarily want to dive into right now, creating that sense of urgency is a fine way to avoid having to craft a lot of content on the fly. And I think really that's sort of the key takeaway that I kind of, uh, I, I, I take out of this. But um, before we go, I, I wanna ask, uh, Andrew, where can we find your stuff? How can we get a hold of you? Yeah, so my, my First book in the Ardalancourt series in Times of War, A Tale of Ardalancourt, is available on Amazon. Mm. Uh, social media-wise, I'm most active on Instagram, at Ardalancourt. And I also publish a substack called Fantasy World Building at andrewzimba.substack.com. There's, uh, at the time of this recording, there's over 20 articles up. Oh, cool. I publish uh, twice a month on various aspects of world building. And I most of them focus on the how. Based yeah. on what elements you've selected, how do we put these things together? And just for example, like this element of time, time to yeah. react versus just enough, oh, sorry, time to plan versus just enough time to react in how that can shape the world and the story you're telling. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, and thank you, dear viewer, for joining us on another episode of the Worldcraft Club podcast. We really appreciate you hanging out. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform or YouTube as it may be. Appreciate you coming. Bye.